Hi, and welcome to episode two of Trash Arts Tick with myself, Ryan. Sam. Jackson. On today's show, we're going to bring you guys up to speed with the industry. Um, and we're going to try and do this every single week. Then we're going to actually discuss our favourite films of 2019, which weren't actually nominated for any of the Oscars. And we've all got our own opinions um, and our own favourite film each. And then we're going to go on and have Tom Lee Rudder join us. Uh, Tom Lee Rudder recently had Day of the Stranger premiere at Horror on Sea, which is the event we spoke about in the last episode. So without further ado, let's crack on guys. Sam, over to you for industry. Okay, so uh, it's Sundance at the moment, Sundance Film Festival. And every year there's usually like a couple of acquisitions. And people have been trying to say like that maybe indie films with the new streaming and the lack of making money at the box office, will people be running to these festivals and buying smaller films? And uh, that they are. Big studios have spent a lot of money. There have been a couple of like big acquisitions. There's a film called Palm Springs with Andy Samberg that's going to Hulu, 15 million. Then there's a Night House, which is a horror film that's going to Searchlights, which if you remember last week, used to be Fox, but now it's a mouse. And then there's Uncle Frank with Paul Bettany and that went for 12 million. But the majority seems to be going more towards the, the kind of uh, streaming sites. Streaming sites have been very like much active in Sundance. I think Netflix have like five films already in competition. So despite like Cannes Film Festival that is very rejective of streaming sites, Sundance is open arms and it, that's how it should be. The only problem with these massive acquisitions is that Amazon tried to do the same thing last year. They bought loads of films and none of them really performed at the box office whatsoever. It was very embarrassing for Amazon. So it's surprising like that people are diving so quickly back into it. Because Sundance provides some films that might have that instant kind of feeling of this is great, but it doesn't mean it's always going to cross over. But looking at the Oscars, um, <clears throat> there was a Producers Guild and 1917 won, which means the Oscars is going to be really boring <laughs> and it's probably going to get all the awards, but hopefully it won't and it'll go to, it'll go to Parasite. Because, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, there's still the possibility. And finally, more on an indie horror level and a personal note, Bloomhouse, who usually I love, have decided they're going to remake The Thing. Now, before like getting into that, this isn't The Thing, the John Carpenter's version. This is from a book that's been found, like some old book that was a version of The Thing. What, before like the, the original? Yeah. The, the Thing? Because what was it called before The Thing? The from Thing that... Out of Space or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, essentially, yeah, they, they are doing a version of that. But knowing how Bloomhouse got so much success from Halloween and they're in the business of John Carpenter, I yeah. imagine it's going to lean heavy on, personally, my favourite horror film of all time. So usually I love Bloomhouse and personally I feel like they're getting a little bit too much into the swing of the revisionist sequel, remakey, great films with good directors and they should get back to the original films like Get Out Paranormal Activity, Insidious, films that were like original ideas that were very cheap and yeah, made but, lots of money. But, but I mean, reinvention of the stories is just like what always happens. So like, yeah, no, I, no. I, I, you know, <laughs> I think that it depends on the creative ambition behind it, doesn't it? Like, So I'm, I'm interested to see it. I think that would be kind of... I think time will tell, won't it? Yeah. If they do get the success that they had, like they had with Halloween, then it could actually be a stroke of genius. Yeah. Well, this is it. I'm always welcome to see what angle they go with, you know, because that's, that's what it's all about. It's all about, like Jackson said, remakes have been since the beginning. In the old days, they remade films because, you know, they had to, because they yeah. didn't have the films, because they got yeah. destroyed and stuff, you know? So it makes sense. The remakes make money, and remakes, reinventing ideas, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just how heavily they're leaning to just copying what Carpenter did so well. Mm. I guess we'll see. Yeah, yeah, you want to you want to remake, not a rehash. So yeah, basically moving on, what we wanted to discuss in a little bit more detail is our favorite films of twenty nineteen. Um, so personally, for me, my favorite film was Ad Astra. So just to forewarn you guys listening in, spoiler warning. Um, <laughs> so we will be talking a little bit of detail with each film. 
Um, so if you haven't seen the films, once we mention them, uh, yeah, and you don't want it to be spoiled for you, maybe skip on to the end. Yeah. We'll, we'll earmark it. Um, yeah, so my favourite film of last year that was outside the Oscars was Ad Astra. And for me personally, I think <clears throat> it was really interesting seeing Brad Pitt within two completely different roles in 2019. Obviously, he was in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which he was brilliant in. But Ad Astra was a completely different kind of film. And his performance within it as the lead, it kind of, it almost, it was a really compelling performance because of the way that the, uh, the direction of the story went. So for the, you know, those of you that don't know, uh, the whole premise of it is about a astronaut, very successful astronaut, um, called Roy McBride, who's played by Brad Pitt. He uh, basically gets given a mission where he has to go to the furthest reaches of space, just on the cusp of Neptune, um, to effectively find out what this weird kind of sonic beam is that's coming from out the uh, far reaches of space. Um, and yet, yeah, to also try and understand the truth behind his father, who went on a very similar mission, I think it was 30 years prior to um, Brad Pitt's character actually going on it. Um, and yeah, I think whenever the, the setup of the film came out, you didn't really understand the attention to detail, initially anyway, um, of the in-depth of the characters and Brad Pitt's performance within it just gives you a whole different level of characterization within the film. Um, and especially whenever he does come to the end and he does meet his father and he has to then choose whether or not to save the rest of humanity and stop this pulsating wave. Um, but that would also mean sacrificing his father. And it, it's just really, really heartbreaking. And you're not expecting it. You kind of know that he'll probably come across his father, but it would go in a, a different way. And yeah, I just, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I remember when I watched it with you, I just, I love the fact that Tommy Lee Jones' character, who was the father, he essentially is a Christian in space. Yeah. Who's on a desperate kind of, convinced that there's something out there, because they're supposed to be going out there to find new life, aren't they? And mm. they don't find anything. And he just loses his mind because of it, and ends up like, killing his crew and stuff, and getting close to ending the world. Because he just can't accept. And I just you rarely see Christianity in the very, very much like because it's a very it's a science fiction film, but it doesn't. I remember we were talking about it, it doesn't focus too heavily on the science. It's more like this is the world. Yep, yeah, we're driving around the moon. That's cool. That's what's going down. And you just don't. You don't need to sort of like. They're not explaining every little logical point to it. No. I think I said to you as well that the director James Gray. He generally doesn't do these sort of films, like big films. He does very much smaller films that are character focused. This is the biggest film, they, that, the biggest budget he's worked with. And you can feel that. You can feel this isn't a mainstream, big sci fi, like gravity kind of thing, you know? It's just. It, it comes from more of an artistic angle, even the fact that Max Richter scored it, and that's a stunning yeah, yeah. score. Uh, yeah, I agree. And like you say, go on. Oh, I was just going to... So is it, is it sort of character focused? Because I've yeah. not seen it. So but. effectively, from the get-go, you're kind of in this world and that's it. you just got to accept it. That's, okay. You're in this world. That, like, um, them being able to travel out to the moon and go to far reaches of space is kind of... It's not common, but they can do it within their worlds. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you just have to kind of go along with that, which then gives you more time to then focus on the character development mm. and um, how you, well, especially Brad Pitt's character has yeah. to deal with the emotion as the story then goes on and the realisation that he's he's going to bump into his father at some point, but what kind of state is his father going to be in? And like you said, with the so Christianity. Is his father dead or? No. no. Oh, I he's thought just been stuck. died or something. I, uh, yeah. So no, that's where that's the, cool. the Christianity side of it comes in, is that he's mm. so determined on his mission that he spent like the last 30 years in the far reaches of space. Mm. Um, and he's trying to, I suppose, find some sense of, well, there is something, there's got to be more, there's yeah. got to be more. And because, he's, yeah, because he ends up killing all of his crew, he just like goes crazy. 
So by the time oh, okay. Brad Pitt turns up, he's trying to bring him back and he just doesn't want to. So then Brad Pitt's got an ultimatum to make, really. Oh. It's really interesting. Yeah, sounds cool. So, Sam? So yeah, the film I want to talk about, um, again, the, the thing is with, there were so many films I absolutely loved that were mostly like, they were Oscar films or they were films that were similar to everybody else's. So I kind of wanted to look at um, an indie horror film that I saw last year called Bliss. No, he's got to introduce his film with a, with a whole... Uh, no, oh, no. I wanted to choose something different from other people because, like, I know more. No, 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 just like, this isn't my favourite, favourite film of the year. To, to be honest, I spent quite a while thinking out what I wanted to pick. So yeah. I was just like, yeah, I'll do that one. I really like this film. It's stuck in my mind and that's why I wanted to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, no, no, go, go ahead. There it is. Go ahead. So it's a film called Bliss. It's directed by Joe Bagos. He also wrote and produced it. And it stars uh, Dora, uh, <clears throat> Dora Madison. And uh, essentially, it's, it's a vampire film, but it's done in a unique way that I, I like that they, they, how they blended it. Because essentially, it's about this woman who's an artist, and she's got this piece that she needs to get completed, and it needs to be done as soon as possible sort of thing. And she also loves drugs. And she goes to a drug dealer, and she's like, give me something to like, you know, push me to go further. And he's like, I've got this stuff called Bliss. And she takes it, and from meeting other characters, it becomes clear that this drug is associated with being a vampire. And it becomes very literal. It becomes very violent, very gory. There's so much blood in the film, it's insane. But the thing is, with... You kind of think that, though, being a vampire. <laughs> no, totally, no, yeah. The, the, the levels of, like... It's messy business. Yeah, they wouldn't be doing it right if there wasn't any. <laughs> it's, it's such a scuzzy film, because it has so many different levels to it. So it's, like, it's got loads of, like sleazy kind of sex in it but at the same time it's got these real artistic dance performances almost of the character and like the, 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 the lead actress Dora Madison she's amazing in it and like I've not really seen her in much else I checked out IMDb she had clearly a lot of bit roles and stuff but she is so good in it and she's your focus and the film like twists and turns like constantly and one of the ways like it literally twists and turns like the camera just starts like twisting and turning mid shot. And I, I love stuff like that because it really pushes you into what they're trying to do. And it is lots of style and lots of crazy stuff that happens. But it's only like an hour 20. So you're just kind of in the moment with it and you just stay with it. It was just a really great like... Do you ever feel like you get to the point of the end and it should have been longer or is it just enough? Yeah, that's it. It felt like when it ended, I was just like, yeah, wow, that was an experience. And that's and they kept staying with me and thinking about it. It's a very it is a very like heavy metal kind of film, but it's not. It's just it, it's got a lot of that culture in it and stuff, and a lot of the places they go to and all that kind of stuff. But there's so much craziness going on, especially when she's like twisting as the vampire and she just wants to kill more and everybody starts dying and it's just nuts. It's an absolutely crazy film and it felt like like a good. You knew it was on a low budget. Like, I'm, it's probably not going to be like uh, like zero budget sort of <laughs> kind of stuff, but it was still on a low budget. And it just had this real scuzzy sort of California look that wasn't necessarily what you'd see in a lot of like mainstream vampire stuff. It didn't care about the fact that it was clearly a vampire film because it mixed in with the addiction and just outrageously hed hedonistic behaviour, which you associate with vampires. But because it's so barbaric in this, that it, you know, it goes on its own little curve. So yeah, my, my favourite film was uh, was Midsummer, um, and that was uh, uh, it was visually stunning. It 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 really sort of it was very emotional, um, and I I mean it was it was billed as a horror film. I wouldn't necessarily say it was a horror film. I know that causes some contention with you, Sam, it's but it's it's it, <laughs> it, it, it's it is and it isn't. I think um, it just doesn't feel like at any point that you're you're scared uh, as so much as unsettled throughout all of it. And I think there are other films that are similar to that. But anyway, I, I, I'm getting off, off point now. <laughs> so the, the premise of the film is a group of um, college friends uh, who have sort of toxic relationships, I suppose, um, particularly the main, the main couple. Um, they fly out to Scandinavia to see uh, this festival um, from... Is it a pagan, I suppose, pagan 
they don't really explain exactly what the religion no, is, do they? It's more but it, the holiday, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's the May it's the May Day. No, May. Where's this? Mayfair? May, May it's Midsummer. So it's, Midsummer. Yeah. <laughs> the name of the of film. The name of the film. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's it, it, it's something. It's like that midsummer celebration. Uh, Beltane, it's called sometimes. Yeah, like, yeah, there's yeah. other there's other names for it. Um, but uh, so they so they go out to this festival and they see these essentially horrific acts that are being carried out um, during this this ritual celebration of, of the, the the solstice, um, and. Uh, the thing that's the thing that I just loved about this was the way that it played with the the experiences and the emotions of the characters, uh, the the sort of performance arty uh, type bits where you've got these crowds of people all uh, wailing together because because the one the main character um, played by uh, Florence Pugh, um, she is. Uh, She's just absolutely distressed and distraught, and she's she's wailing, and all these other female characters around her are, are joining her with the same emotion, and it and it just pounds you with sort of uh, uh, emo emotional sort of content um, mm. at different points, and and then gives you a complete void of them at other points when she can't uh, can't deal with her emotions in front of her boyfriend, who's who's uh, just. I mean, he he's awful in many ways, but in other ways, he is a, a quite a fair representation of what a, me, a lot of men can be like. And and you kind of recognise certain elements of yourself in him, and that kind of makes him more hateable because you're like, you oh, are you bastard! Why aren't you doing things properly? Um, and uh, that's that's the thing is, it's this, it's it's such a deep film with this with this like strong relationship going throughout mm. it. Um, that that you're you're watching her sort of overcome him in many ways, um, aided by this this cult of of wacky religion, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. <laughs> wacky religious people. Um, but yeah, it, it, coming out of the cinema after that, I mean, we saw it in the middle of the day, so when we mm. came out, it was still bright outside. And I've got to say, it's the first time I've come out of a cinema seeing a film in daylight and felt eerie because the, the whole film is just it's all daylight except for like a couple of scenes because where they are on the on the um in scandinavia is so so far north that they don't really get like a, like an hour of night time or something like that um and yeah it's just it's just really a really powerful film um i recommend watching it so right now, guys, on the show, what we want to do is introduce um, Tom Lee Rudder. So Tom Lee Rudder, uh, like mentioned before, he's the director and creator, writer of Day of the Stranger, which we had the pleasure of viewing at Horror on Sea. Um, so hi, Tom. How you doing, guys? Yeah, good, man. You okay? Wicked. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I'm sat in my study and uh, been anticipating waffling on about film. So really, Tom, what we wanted to do was just cover a few key points, and yeah. and to kick things off, yeah, what kind of made you want to become a filmmaker? Um, I think it's just the uh, the early obsession of watching horror films as as far back as I can remember. Just being a like my brother and myself, we were video junkies, so uh, and there was always this promise of like a a scarier film out there that the parents warn you against, and we just wanted to track those films down, and. Obviously, we'd get to watch those films and wouldn't really be scared by them. We'd just really more be concerned about how they were made, and then, uh, and then we just started mimicking these films, and the, and then we, we'd steal their the, the parents' camcorder and start making films with our cuddly toys. They were our first cast members, so that would go from being I don't know ripoffs of say Indiana Jones to being like zombie films, and then uh, eventually Teddy pornos. <laughs> so. And I think again the, uh, the the next nat well the next natural step was just to kind of rope in our friends really and just and then it became uh, and then you know it became something that we just couldn't stop doing and so we just had to pursue it. Nice. What was the first film you ever done, Tom? Oh uh, God, um, it depends. It depends. Uh, again, it depends really because you got the Teddy era, the cuddly toy era. <laughs> 
you got the era that we were shooting films before we even realised that you had to edit films because we used to shoot loads of like zombie films uh, in camera and edit it in camera and that would include like stopping and starting the CD player or the cassette player so the music would try and play along with each shot and then we realised that editing was a thing and then I think the first edited film I made was a short called Bad Trip where this guy just uh, uh, takes this this, this uh, kind of drug which doesn't exist but um, and then I just went crazy on some of the editing tactics that I was learning so um, and then it had some guns in it and a bit of blood and it was like 25 minute film something like that and um, well I, I made like uh, 10, 10 or 20 copies on VHS and just kind of gave them out at school and uh, and I, I kind of gave one to a friend of mine uh, who you're acquainted with Steve and uh, and I think I don't I don't even have a copy myself anymore so I think he still has a copy and uh, I haven't seen it for years and quite frankly I hope I don't because I was the main character in it so I'd rather not see it again <laughs> I know when we go back over some of our earlier stuff I hate it not, not that it, we're bad or anything, it's just, you know, when you see yourself on film acting and you're like, oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Well, I was the only guy I could rely on, you know, so um, it was before kind of building up that confidence to kind of make other people do your bidding, so... Uh, but the thing is, it was always me framing as well, so I'd kind of frame the shot, then run in front of the camera and act it out, and it was usually out of frame, so... <laughs> <laughs> Trying to do it all, one-stop shop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, Tom... One of the reasons that we wanted to get you on and um, what we're trying to do with um, this podcast is to get a little bit more involved within the indie um, filmmaking yeah. scene. And um, it obviously seems quite nice for us to get you involved simply well, because sir. of Day of the Stranger. Well, also, uh -huh. we're on the same label, Dark Side. Yes, well, as it happens, I sent off all the elements for that today, so... I can rest easy, and hopefully they, 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 all the, they all check out fine, and then the release can go ahead in a few months. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, Tom, so on Day of the Stranger, what was your inspiration behind it? Like, How did you come up with that whole concept? Because it's, it's very unique, and it's the first of its kind, isn't it? Yeah, well... Um I think at the time uh, it was kind of it was made during a period of inactivity. It was kind of like a couple of years, and I hadn't really started anything of any note or anything. And and um, I was really into my head trip cinema at the time, like the films of Alexander Jodorowsky and Kenny Fanger, and and there's a film called Performance with Mick Jagger in. They're all really trippy fucking films, man. And um, and uh, well. I don't know, I, I guess I was just kind of keeping tabs on the indie landscape and I was kind of getting a bit fatigued with the kind of this oversaturated market and you'd see a lot of the same kind of stuff and we still do so what I kind of wanted to do was just tap into something that just wasn't being done and I guess me being the film nerd that I am I was kind of mining back through the ages to find a sub-genre that could still be kind of elaborated on maybe so... I figured an acid western might have been the way to go, and couple that with um, a couple, a few locations we got in our local area because we have a lot of sandstone around here, and we'd be on our way to our friends, and we'd go past this common which is full of sand and and land and sandstone and whatnot, and every time I was just like, wow, you could just film a western there, you know, and and so one day we kind of you know picked ourselves up and we just went out and, and, and went for it and that was on a hot day in April in 2014 and then we kind of realized well I suppose we've got to shape a film around this now and then six years later there we go <laughs> <laughs> so Tom talk to us a little bit about the process of the film because it did take its time didn't it you had a few hiccups yeah. and bumps along the road and um, yeah oh, yeah, I think I made every possible uh, mistake you could make making a film with this one um, uh, to the point where I genuinely did not believe it would ever see the light of day. I mean, I divorced myself from it several times over and I think one of our main problems was is that um, I kind of I, I bashed out a first draft script and um, it was a riff on a, an old Mark Twain short story called The Mysterious Stranger which is really quite a deep read if you've ever read it um, and I just wanted to lift passages from that and kind of shape it into a western and um, 
but I was making it so kind of talky and kind of pseudo philosophical and it was just so so boring uh, but we didn't kind of stop to really reassess this we just kind of went forward and started filming and um, and then I realized that kind of wasn't working because the guy the the actor we had at the time playing the stranger he he was really really enthusiastic but he didn't really quite grasp what I wanted out of the character because he was meant to be a menacing and really kind of you know all encompassing and just a supernatural kind of um, being really and he really did not portray that <laughs> so um uh, we kind of had this sprawling film which seemed to be getting longer and longer and longer and uh, it just doesn't really seem to be hitting any notes so we'd go back and reshoot all those scenes and I'd slightly rewrite them so we we're basically filming as I was rewriting and you should never really do that I suppose <laughs> Yeah because you don't really have a final point of what you want Exactly, and then the kind of point of the film got lost uh, to the point where friends would ask me what it's about and I really, at that point, wouldn't be able to tell them. So it kind of just changed uh, into something else and it was something in, in, indecipherable. And and then on top of that, uh, to make uh, further sequences work, we'd have to introduce new characters and new subplots and, and it just became so kind of out of hand that um, I just needed to take a step back for a while and that's what I had to do. And then I went on to make other films instead, <laughs> much to the uh, much to the dismay of some of the cast members. But it always brought you back. The thing is, sometimes, well, sometimes with indie films, you have to do that. You have to realise that it, perhaps like taking a bit of a pause and coming back to it will only make it stronger. But your skills will get absolutely. better with the other things you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, the problem I had is. Um, uh, the whole town asking me, when is it ready? When's it ready? When's it out? When's it out? And uh, I had to kind of just bat that off and just kind of like think about artistic integrity over keeping everyone happy. And um, sometimes it was quite crippling. <laughs> and the relations got strained with one of the cast members to the point where it did turn a bit ugly. And that was again because it was taking too long. And you know what? I can sympathize with that because sometimes you put a lot of work into something, you want to see something out of it. But he just wasn't really considering the fact that, you know, if I don't think he's not tr putting his trust in me being like, you know, satisfied with the product. And if I'm not satisfied with it, then it's not going to get released, isn't it? So, you know, it's just as simple as that, really. <laughs> it was worth the wait you know oh thank you yeah well um that's a whole different kind of experience for me altogether because right up to the end i, I, I had these kind of uh, demons building up and anxieties behind the thing that i just couldn't see it for what it was i just i could only see it for what it wasn't and and i think um i think when we finally screened it it kind of just kind of evaporated those demons so it was quite good you relaxed you deserve to relax yeah, well, yeah, it was really, really was like a purge. It was just crazy because it was almost like, wow, I can kind of almost close the book on this now. So, Tom, talk to us a little bit about your experience at Horror on Sea. I just freaking love Horror on Sea, you know. It's just the, it's literally like uh, the, the, the one weekend I truly look forward to every year. Um, I went on my own first with a film called Bell and the Witch Home, just me and the other half. Um, and... And it was just a, re a really beautiful eye-opener of a weekend because I realised there was a community there. But at the same time, I was still quite shy and on my own. And then <laughs> uh, then the next year, I went with uh, my friend Baz Hancher with his film White Goods that I, I, I had an appearance in and, and kind of made sure he submitted his films so I could expose him and my friends to it. And then again the year after that, it was uh, a case of trying to expose even more filmmaker friends to it, just so we could all have a piece of it. And I think each year's been better, and this year was certainly the best, because I think we all had a laugh, didn't we? And uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, it was just so awesome, you know, and um, everyone's just so kind of, uh, you know, um, enthusiastic of each other's work. There's no kind of... There's no kind of competition involved because there's no winners. It's just everyone's got their slot. And it doesn't matter if you've made a film on a phone and you just wanted to have a stab at it because you've been going and thought, you know, oh, I'd, I'd like, to, like a go at that. They'll give, you the, they'll give you that time on stage, you know. Or whether you've made a film for 30 grand, they all go together, you know. Yeah. I think you've touched on a, a very key point that we spoke about in our last podcast, um, which is the whole community and the network inside of it. At Horror oh, yeah. Sea, it's just unreal, and we experienced that firsthand. <laughs> like Sam <Yeah>. just said, <laughs> a couple of wild nights out, <laughs> celebrating obviously the day of a stranger. 
I think what really makes it important as well is the fact that they're, they're not trying to rip you off like most film festivals are. There's no submission fee, and they make your they make your stay there affordable. You know, they want to make it cheap and doable for people. So it's not even that they're trying to get your money. <laughs> it's great. It's very true. So the last thing for me, Tom, really, is what's next for Tom Lee Rudder? Okay, well, uh, I'm in the middle of my next feature, which is the Pocket Film of Superstitions. This is probably the most exp uh, expensive film I've worked on because I've just been plowing all my wages into it, much to uh, my other half's uh, dismay. Uh, but it's it's just got a lot more kind of... It's just a more a, a, like a sumptuous um, almanac of various superstitions. So, story-wise, there isn't really anything there. It's not as quite, as, I suppose, as layered as some of the other films have done, but it's going to be a feast for the eyes, and hopefully it'll be quaint, scary, and funny at the same time. So, I'm just playing through that at the minute, and hoping that I can get it finished in a kind of reasonable time frame, and not another six years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes sense. Well, have you got uh, anything no, else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't forget about us. Oh well, you know, obviously, uh, on somewhere on the horizon, I want to be working with you guys. You know what I mean? So no, that's true. Uh, we've all got about 100 film ideas in our heads, and we want to get them all out there. But uh, I think like a Portsmouth film would be perfect. You know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, is there anything that you want to say? Any final comments before we go? Well, I'm looking forward to uh, having Day of the Stranger play Portsmouth next month um, because uh, it's pairing up with uh, a film, uh, a trash arts film, Fixer, which is a premiere, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. And that is a co-production with Merlin Films. And I am such a huge fan of Michael J. Murphy because he is kind of like the, um, the pioneer of DIY British uh, filmmaking. And I you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who was doing it before Michael J. Murphy so he's a key figure in what we do um, he is pretty much like yeah the pioneer of, of why we're doing what we're doing and and Horror on Sea probably wouldn't be Horror on Sea if it was, wasn't for Michael J. Murphy so to have uh, our films play alongside one of his is really quite an honour so I can't wait for that Thanks for doing the plug-in for us. Save me one job. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's on the 16th of February. I don't know if you said that, but... <laughs> no, I didn't, actually. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't do the particulars. I was just gushing over the uh, over Pompey Wood, you know? <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who is listening, uh, yeah, Day of the Stranger is um, showing at the Wedged Rooms on the 16th of February. So please come down and... Um, yeah, it'll be a great day. Three films. I think what what I'll add to that is is um, again uh, some great filmmakers that we've we've met at Horror on Sea, mm -hmm. uh, including Andrew Elias, who made a film called The Numbers, which is very good. Um, thanks to our chance meeting, he's going to be coming down to that event, so yeah, you nice. guys will get to to meet Andrew. That's cool. On that note, Tom, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you for coming on um, to the podcast today. Really Sounds appreciate like it. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you next month and uh, sure the next projects. Yeah, likewise, yeah, we'll be, uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about and a lot to drink, so that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, man, you take care of yourself, Tom. Yeah, have a good time, guys, and I'll see you soon. No worries. Thank, take care. Thanks for having me on. Take care. No worries. Bye. See you then. Bye. So, guys, we hope you liked the show today. Um, once again, we'll be doing this every week. And um, if you do like what we have to say, you like what you hear, uh, please give us a like, please give us a, a subscribe, and um, expect more content coming your way very, very soon. Other than that, T-A-T-I.